Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Pumphrey, and this is History After Hours podcast. With me today is, as usual, Ron Franklin, but also it is a live podcast at Collective Coffee. It is March 1st, 2018. And so what we're trying to do is we are trying to uh, schedule it to where the first Thursday of every month we will be live in downtown Hot Springs at Collective Coffee. You can come check us out. And what we uh, did tonight is we played a little acoustic music and then we had some uh, music by Nathan Bridges and then we had a little Q&A session with all the students that showed up. We had a pretty packed house and they asked a lot of interesting questions, a lot of political stuff as as normal, but a lot of other stuff as well. And uh, yeah, it's a good time. Then we finished the night off with some acoustic music. We definitely had a great time. We want to thank the owners of Collective Coffee for having us out. We also want to give a shout out to Abby Hanks, our producer, who organizes all of this stuff for us. And uh, we could, you wouldn't be hearing anything if it wasn't for her putting all this together. So we definitely appreciate your support. Make sure to subscribe to us wherever you may find us, whether it is on SoundCloud or Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. And uh, yeah, rock and roll. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Collective Coffee, everyone. This is History After Hours Podcast. We play a little music. Welcome. We sing a few songs. This is it. No, here we go. The crowd has shown themselves. This whole podcast for the next several minutes is just going to operate on your questions. So if you guys have anything you'd like to ask of our extensive knowledge, uh, if we don't know it, I'm sure somebody knows it in here. But yeah, Mm -hmm. questions. We also have some that people have sent in, so we can go through those if we need to. So, what are your questions? Oh, wait a minute. I have a hand up right in front of me. Go, sir. What's your question? Are you asking me math questions? All right. I'm going to answer all of them with a true statement. I don't know. That is absolutely true. What was that? A math question? Sorry, I was... Yeah, no. It, okay. We got to do homework Some, for them? My name... Officially, you are a jack wagon. Mm-hmm. That's Ask me those questions. All right, here we go. Serious question. Go. Opinion on gun control. Going to go political right off the bat, out of the gun, so to speak. Oh, well, let's see. Well, um, should it? Well, that's that's way too simplistic. Yeah. Should should guns be controlled or not controlled? That's that's what you're asking me. Um. Okay. Well. In light of the recent events, let's, uh, all right, no, let's, let's take that up a notch and go, do we think it's a good idea to arm teachers? Since we're teachers, let's just go ahead and do that one. Be a little more simplistic. Um, I have a concealed carry permit. And I'm already armed. And, uh, <laughs> and leg. Sorry. Look at him, he's got armed and Normal. leg. Look at him. Um, I don't, here's the thing. Okay, let's, let's, let me be serious about this. Um, here's what it takes to be a teacher. You ready? We have at least four years worth of professional degree that we have to get under our belts. A lot of us have master's degree, including myself. So that's another two, three years on top of that. We have in this state 60 hours, well, 30 hours that are required professional development every single year on top of the professional degree that we already have. We also at our school have 30 on top of that. So we have 60 hours of professional development. Um, I don't know that it's reasonable to suggest that on top of all of that extensive training that we also have to go and get all of the extensive training that it would take to carry a firearm to handle that properly in every situation. Now, here's what I'm talking about. Um, It it would be easy enough to say, well, a guy with a concealed carry permit and go off and get more uh, training to go off and carry the school and be licensed to carry one in school. But that's a lot more training on top of what we already have. That's the first thing. Like, when am I going to get that done? On top of teaching, right? Like, we have a certain amount. Am I going to do that in my spare time? Am I going to do that in the summertime? And you're going to have to do that consistently every single year because even people that are in the military and the police force will tell you that they have to go and continually grade themselves on their marksmanship skills and then go through uh, through 
sort of pressure training, if you will, in, in real life sort of scenarios, right? How can you react responsibly in the middle of a crisis? On top of that, let's talk about the fact that I got into this to be a teacher, right? I'm not sure that I also should be required to be a member of SEAL Team 6 or a Navy, uh, an Army Ranger in order to be able to apply my craft. I, I just don't know that that's a, I don't know how many people could actually get all of those things done. Okay, so let's say that we do that and we arm teachers, and I'll just, I'll just use myself as the example, right? Um, let's say that I've got 25 to 30 kids in a classroom and we have something that goes down in the hall and is it, is it my responsibility to abandon those 30 kids to get out in the hall and see if I can do something about that? Do we have multiple teachers that are out in the hall trying to take out some sort of culprit and do we have some sort of crossfire scenario? Do I see somebody else with a gun and think that they're the ones and I haven't had crisis training especially? I don't, I don't, know, I don't know that we're actually creating a more secure environment when the actual event takes place, if the actual event takes place, is what I'm saying. Um, there are so many variables that would that would that could go wrong. I, I'm I'm not a police officer, right? I don't. I mean, we can take Florida as the example. There were people who were trained police officers. That was their entire job was to protect that school, and they still didn't react the way that a lot of people thought they should have. I just I just don't know that that's. I, I've heard people say, well, it's it's a deterrent, right? We could have, if we have a lot of armed people in the building, then maybe somebody who's doing something, you know, they got in their mind they're going to do something stupid and go up and shoot places up that they would be less likely to go in there because they know that there's so many people that are armed. I don't even know that that's a good defense because a lot of these people, if you go back and look at the different histories, they're not looking to get out of that building. Like most of them know they're not going to walk out. Either they're going to take their own lives or the, or the police are going to take care of them. So I don't know that the idea that of threatening a person who's threatening to do something like this with more immediate death is really going to be the deterrent that we think it is. I mean, if they were afraid for their lives, they probably wouldn't be doing this to begin with, right? So I, I, just, don't, I just don't know that it's a great idea. I disagree. Everyone should be strapped and ready to roll. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I so agree with what, that, too. Do you have... I just don't... I just don't Shootouts in the hallway? Do, okay, so and, and the other person... I saw somebody else say, talk about, well, we're going to give them a bonus. I think the president said that. Well, maybe we'll give them a bonus for doing this. Okay, fantastic. Um, where does that money come from? Do, do smaller districts, how are they able to afford something like that? Or if we're even going to put more armed people on campus, I mean professionals on campus, that's their entire job. Uh, uh, that money has to come from somewhere. Do At we raise schools, a millage? Do we raise taxes? Do we, yeah, I don't know. I mean, At most schools, they don't even have the resources they need anyway. So I don't know where the money's going to come right. from. And think, let's think this forward. Let's say there's a sh another shooting, horrible, and a teacher who just got trained freaks out yeah. and they accidentally shoot an innocent student. Can you imagine the fallout I saw from a, that? I, I mean, co but listen, cops, mm. trained people freak out and shoot the wrong person, right. and, and that's with years of training. I just... I, I wouldn't want to be the guy who accidentally... You know what I'm saying? Or, or even if I did get the person who was the culprit to think that I'm, I could have shot past that person on, you know, and then maybe hit some innocent bystander. And I saw somebody bring that up to a, to a, a school, I guess it was a superintendent somewhere who was saying, well, I think that's a good idea. Um, they said, well, what if you accidentally hit a, an innocent kid? And he goes, well, but at least we s saved all these other kids. And I'm thinking, am I going to, if I, I'm a parent, am I going to send my school to, I mean, my kid to a school where the superintendent says, well, some of the kids are expendable. I, I, I don't know. See, that doesn't make sense to me. So I don't think there's I don't think that's a good scenario. Trying to find ways to secure campuses, I don't have a problem with that. Finding the resources to get that done, that's going to be tricky. Um, Funneling, it's so funnel, why don't we just deal with the actual problem, which is kids that are a little off, a little alone, maybe depressed, and if we're going to spend money on something, try to spend money to help identify these kids early. And get them the help they need before this happens in the first place, right. instead of just let's, throwing more guns. Let's jump this out here, though. And I brought this up to a class the other day because we were having this conversation. Um, when they talk about mental health stuff, because that's always a big part of the conversation, or people say that it should be, and that's fine. Let's do that. But here's the thing: mental health issues can occur at any point in time in someone's life. So let's say that I was perfectly sane and passed that background check, and I'm perfectly mentally healthy when I bought that gun. But years down the line, something happened. Now I'm not as stable as I used to be. Now what do you do? So the only explanation that makes sense to a lot of people is to say that the availability of the weapons happens to be the issue more so than anything else. 
And to suggest that it can't be part of the solution really is narrow-minded, myopic, and probably asinine, to tell you the truth. So, Madison. Uh, okay, right, so, so her question is how do, how do we feel about the student-led protests that are going on in Florida? You mean activism just in general? My children aren't much older than you, okay? And um, in that particular case, in Florida specifically, right, those kids are like, I don't, it's tragic, right? And people have to deal with their grief and their anger and, and all the things that, I mean, if people who are in charge of securing your future seemingly can't do that and or seemingly aren't listening when you say that you want something done, then, you, you know, you're citizens of this country, and you have the right to peaceful protest. You're not, you're, you're, until you hit 18, you know, you can't vote and all that stuff, but it doesn't matter. Like, you can still be active, and so... There's no age limit for citizenship. Yeah, there's you, no, for being natural-born citizens, there's no age limit for activism. I think that it's, I think that it's a positive thing for people to express in mass, especially like that, in a peaceful way, and, and, and express your anger. And a lot of those kids were going through, and that's a grieving process for a lot of them, right? It, um, so I, I, I applaud that effort, and we'll see where it goes. Um, a lot of activism tends to be youth-based anyway that, you know, the younger generations tend to be the ones who push for change. And I mean, we can talk about civil rights movement and all those things. A lot of it was youth-led, right? So, Noah. Okay, we... Oh, here we go. You talking about the the militia part of that or... Okay. How did... Do you want, to, do you want us to tell you how the Supreme Court interprets it or what? We're gonna, are we going to get into a conversation about commas like everybody else does? I mean, yeah, okay. All right, well, let, and I don't mean to just dominate this, but let me let me jump on this real quick. When the amendment was written, we needed militias. And the reason we needed militias that were controlled by the local authorities, these aren't vigilante militias, by the way, right? That's not the interpretation. The idea, well, regulated means somebody's in charge of them. The reason you need a militia is because there's no police force. The reason you need a militia is because there's no National Guard. The reason you need a militia is because there is absolutely not a standing military to take care of problems that may rise up. So you need to be able to have an armed citizenry that can then take care of problems that may, right? That is a that is a necessity. We have a police force. We have National Guard. We have first responders and all kinds of things that we, that we didn't have before. So I don't know, like depending on, I don't, the interpretation of it isn't so much important to me right now as it is the fact that it's absolutely unnecessary, and that should be part of the conversation. I'm not saying I'm a Second Amendment supporter. I own weapons. I, like I said a while ago, I have a concealed carry permit. But times have changed, and conditions have changed, and we have not changed our thinking on this at all. We haven't budged on it one single bit. Matter of fact, I think we've gone and entrenched it in the other direction, saying, "Well, it's interpretive to be." that everybody can have any gun they want to defend themselves and their family and their property and, and rise up against the government. I mean, all these conspiracy-minded people that really think that that you need to have armaments at your house and weapons of war, like that, that's, that is not what this was intended to be. And, and the, so, the Second Amendment is not a holy scripture from the Bible. It's an, a change to the original Constitution that didn't have it. So it's not something our forefathers our fathers were like, okay, we got to have that. No, they didn't even they didn't want it. It was challenged and listed just to get the Constitution passed. So, I mean, it's it's an amendment to the original Constitution, but everything is interpreted. I mean, you know, we're we're trying to figure these things out, and you know, I don't look at the amendments like they're untouchable. Any of them. And besides like, that, the, and the technolo technological change since then too, right? I mean, I, there's no way that they could have ever fathom the idea that we could have weapons like we have today. I just don't see that that could have been part of their thinking. It, it just wasn't part of the reality. And so do we just blindly accept that as gospel, like you kind of alluded to, and then run on with it no matter what? No matter what. Like, it's obviously a problem. So what do we do with that? Well, you can, you can be angry at each other for bringing it up, and you can say, well, you, you know, take all the guns away or don't give, you know, don't take anything, no restrictions at all. But somewhere we've got, we've, we've talked about this a lot. The only workable space in a political system is in the middle. And if all you do is ramp yourself to the end and then yell 
obscenities at each other, then all we're doing is driving ourselves into the ditch. You've got to be able to find some compromise on this somewhere. And without that, I, this is going to be a continual problem in our society, I think, and maybe even grow worse. And I, and I hate to see that, right? Because I want my kids and grandkids to be able to grow I, up. I think this is with different, though. Security. I think from the other, with the, the, the pro student protesters and all that, I think, and because these shootings have happened so quickly, I think people just want some sort of action. You, you, and they just want to see something. Now, I don't know what that is, and both sides have said common sense gun laws, both of them. It just depends on what that is. And you are fighting to a degree the NRA. You know, arming teachers is a great thing for the NRA. That's 700,000 more weapons on the... Yeah, even if you, get, they, even they if you just get 20% more of the people who are teachers to, to carry weapons, 700 and something thousand people, right? That's what that is. Uh, you know, I, but just let's, since you brought the NRA up, let's talk about that for a second. What I've heard people complain about say, well, uh, the other night when they had the town hall and Rubio was out there in Florida and, and like that was pretty gutsy, I think, for him to step up there because he knew that was going to be a hostile crowd. Um, but And one of the kids was like, well, tell me that you won't uh, accept any more NRA money. And he was hesitant to do that. And I'm not going to criticize him for that. Here's, here's my point. Um, it's not about not accepting their money. If you criticize them or go against them, it's about them having millions of dollars to combat you in the next campaign. And they're good at what they do. They are a professional lobby that is hell-bent on protecting itself. And I get that. I get that. But they will use every resource available to discredit, to disown, and to dishonor, and to smear the candidate that doesn't follow along with what they're doing. So that's the danger. It's not about them pulling... Because one of the kids was like, well, you know, we can raise the same amount of money for you, Marco Rubio, and you won't, have to, you won't need their money. He doesn't need their money. That's the point. They'll use money against him, not for him. That, that's the bigger threat to a lot of these politicians. And so that's something for us to consider. What else? Okay. That was an interesting. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, Yemen is – well, let's, let's address the first thing. You want to know why it's not covered? Is that the, the root of your question? Um, there's there's a there's a conflict slash civil war going on in Yemen, which is right there at the south of the Arabian, the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and uh, Saudi Arabia's been involved, and Iran's been involved, and I want to say some of the other. I mean, you've got lots of rebel groups that have sort of risen up. Um, I, I, to tell you the truth, it is being covered in different parts of the world. We just don't talk about it because we don't have any vested interests, seemingly. Same thing about. Go ahead, no. To get the U.S. involved. Uh, it's, you know, I don't know everything that we're doing because we don't, we do a lot of special ops work that we're never told about. And I don't know that we're not there, honestly. We may already have some things going on or at least some funding for different groups that we want to see. Y Yemen is destabilized. And um, I, I don't know that it, it may turn into another scenario like Syria, right? Um, so I don't in, know. That's, in, that's so complex. I don't know. But that's the, but the reason that we're not covering it in our news, like you'll never see it in our newspapers, you'll never see it on our, even though we've got like world news tonight, they don't cover stuff like that because they're going to try to promote, they, they want ratings, they ratings, want ratings, ratings. And that Yemen isn't really a, a flashy topic for a lot of people because I, don't, I would, I would, I would wonder how many people even could identify where Yemen is if I hadn't said it a while ago, right? And so it's about optics. We're, we're also in Afghanistan, by the way. Longest war in American yeah, history. Are you aware of that? <laughs> we, we've been at war your entire lives. But Trump there? equals ratings, so we ignore everything but Trump because that's where the ratings are, yeah, whether you're for him or against him. Yes. That's another good one. <laughs> um, how do I feel about it? Oh. How do we feel about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Um, you want to solve that one real quick? Yeah, well, Jared Kushner's got that one wrapped up, yeah? I think so. Well, okay. Oh, wait, no, no, he just lost his security clearance. So, no, that's not going to be a thing. Uh, mm. I feel that, again, I go back to what I said a while ago about we could find some compromise maybe somewhere, right? The idea that um, Israel is going to claim the entire territory for themselves is, I mean, they are and they have, and that's what they've pushed for, but all the Arab groups are against that. And so, you, I mean, you can't. They're going to have to find some sort of way to compromise between each other. So everybody's going to have to give a little bit. And a lot of it stems around Jerusalem. And the president's just decided to move our, our uh, embassy to Jerusalem as opposed to Tel Aviv, where it's been forever. And that was a clear sign that we support the idea that Israel should own Jerusalem. And that's going to be a hot topic. And it may create a, a worse situation than we already have because they're not going to talk to each other. 
the tempers are, I mean, you don't understand really because you haven't grown up, I mean, seeing that from their point of view, but everybody's mad. They're not like coming to the table to say, well, we can maybe work something out. No, and they're exceedingly mad at each other over this. Um, and there's bad blood on both sides and both sides have made mistakes and both sides will continue to make mistakes, I assume. Everybody's stabbing everybody and then that's not gonna, right, you're, that's not gonna lead to good conversations. So I, I feel that it's a problem. And I feel that it's going to continue to be a problem. Um, I hope that they can resolve something. But honest to God, you're going... And, mo and most countries around the world agree, and most countries that are part of the United Nations agree that the two-state solution is the only way forward. But that's not something you're going to be able to convince Israel of. And since the United States is a 100% supporter of Israel, you're not going to convince us to back that, and therefore it's going to not going to have a lot of bite. So um, it's going to continue to be a problem for a while. You know what? All right, one more. Yep. All right. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah it repeat, used to. Repeat, repeat the question. Okay, so uh, when did this focus on ratings really start? And it, it started in the media when money left journalism. So used to journalists, anchor people, you know, there was three networks. That's all you had. They were all held kind of accountable to tell some version of the truth. They were less biased, but they were getting paid a lot of money to do this. As cable news started to rise in the 90s and offered competition to those major networks, that became kind of a, a battle. And they figured out in the 90s with cable news that you could hit a certain demographic that the, the news wasn't really hitting. You could say it's yellow journalism, sensational storylines. So that happened. When the internet came online, literally, early 2000s, with social media, then anybody can be a newscaster. And then you just have Joe Blow recording himself and ranting, and he gets followed. And then all the network news, all the cable news now has to go, oh, wait, we're going to have to do something in order to get more, or we're going under. Like right now, you know, we talk about Fox News. They get 2 million views a night. You know, your average major podcast has 20 million listeners. So literally you could start a podcast and defeat Fox News or CNN if you are sensational enough and you get people wanting, you know, and really kind of pick it. And it's really the the dead man zone is in the middle. You, you can, it's hard to get ratings. It's hard to be heard if you're a social liberal uh, and a economic conservative. You know, if you, oh, yeah, I'm kind of socially liberal, but I'm also, like me, I'm kind of right on some things, left on some things. Like, I'm not going to get, but if I go, hey, you know what? He's not flashy enough to get ratings is what he's saying, yeah. Right. But if we start just, you know, going one side extreme and railing against the other side, you know, so that's what it is right, right. now, and that's what's polarized our countries. And social media specifically with Facebook and all that, I mean, yeah. that's just share, clickbait, share. It's, Don't do any research. We, we've, we've, Our president did we, that. We've labeled it news <laughs> you know? entertainment. It's they're not really informing you. They're telling you things that they think you already want to know, which isn't news. That's not the same. So thing. let's tell. Okay, where do you go to get try to get besides us? Where do you go to try to get the best bead on what's actually going on? Because it's difficult. I get it. I actually go outside our system. I agree. I, I uh, BBC. Yeah, I you go know to me. AFP, which is a French news agency. I go to Al Jazeera. I go to, I mean, I hit all kinds of different people outside our country to see because they don't have the same sort of, I mean, it's, it's sort of becoming that eventually in other countries as, as they get more sort of infrastructure and the communications and things like that. But yeah, I mean, you to get, if you're just looking at American news sources, like you're going to have to just, and you should do some research on where they tend to land on their stories. You've got some that do kind of float towards the middle. But all of them kind of edge one way or the other, right? So uh, out of all of that, here's the thing I, I think is a problem, that we have a lot of people, I think, who are consuming news at such a rapid pace that they don't have time to be able to sort of sit down and think about what is and what isn't accurate. Like you don't have a real uh, logical response to a lot of things. It's really just kind of blasts of news. You get news updates. You get news blurbs. You get blogging. And, and so it, it, there's a danger in that because people think that they're, seeing real information and it's not vetted in any way it's just thrown out there by the person who has a mic like me right now at this moment All right yes okay the first question is why is isn't there an initiative to teach students today in high school what's actually going on and the stuff that's important 
current events, those type of things. Hmm. Well, test scores have a lot to do with it. Um, our school is ranked, and a lot of people at our school is very concerned about rankings and where we fall on the scale. And if we spend a lot of time talking about current events that you won't be tested over or stuff you really need to know when you're about to enter the railroad, you're not getting tested over any of that information. So administrators have a lot of pressure on them, as do teachers, to teach this stuff that you need to know in order to either be successful in college or on the end of uh, the test scores. Yeah. So that's probably the primary reason, because I've told my students this, that I wish I had a class that I could just title Stuff You Should Know and just every day, let's, okay, listen, here's how you get some credit build up. And, you know, this is how you break up with someone. You know, just really real world things that you do need to know that's never taught in school. Um, where do you get your news? I, that, you know, that's stuff that's yeah. useful, but nobody's teaching it. Yeah. So um, the beauty of social studies classes, though, and we have a little bit of flexibility more so than some other classes, that because we're teaching what has been in order to show you what is. And so we always can make connections to what's going on. And, and, but at the same time, we have real strict standards about what we have to achieve each year. And so sometimes it doesn't allow for as much of that as we would like, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, so y'all need to pr promote me having a separate class just called Stuff You Should Know. But you have to go through our AP histories first before you can take right. it. I don't want anybody signing up for that. A po yeah, it's a, a Things You Should Know podcast. That's yeah. what we we'll have to do. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. your freshman year of college, you can come back. <laughs> Yes. Here's another question. Where? Are we, where? Everybody started moving around. Thought something's about to go down. <laughs> uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> I did. About to pop off. What's happened? All right, okay. go. Okay. He, he's got one more question, oh, real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Two part oh, yeah. question. Part two. There are counseling services that the school has that comes into our school, and they serve several districts. Uh. Because actually the role of counselor, as we used to know it, mm -hmm. used to do that some of that stuff. They don't do that as much anymore. They're more about schedules and advising and, right. and all that. So they're swamped with doing all that and testing. I mean, that's what counselors are organizing mm -hmm. all the tests. And so that has fallen to outside sourcing. So you have businesses, groups that do counseling. And if you went to college and you got a degree in psychology or that's one of the jobs you could get would be a counselor in a public school. And you it's, know, you, you you'd be surprised though about how much counseling isn't about counseling emotional needs. It's about, like you said, scheduling and what comes next and where you're going to go. It's that there's a whole lot of that. There's, there's so much paperwork involved and they don't really have time to oftentimes, I mean, our counselors, I think do a pretty decent job of running up and trying to, but at the same time, they're, they're so booked with things that they've got to do and scheduling conflicts that I don't think that they can sit down and do. And I think that the, imagery that we have in mind about counselors is that they, they're there for the students and they're there for their emotional needs and they'll help them grow as people and that's all that's true but they have to sort of counter that up and balance it with all these other mandated things that they have to do that are really opposite of that in a weird way right so um when you get to college it's i don't i don't know that it's any different school school is a business right and and when we start running that it, it used to be more about personable aspects and I think when the small school mentalities that, that was more evident when we were kids especially but what we've seen is that schools have sort of become like mini corporations and the people who are making decisions about schooling have a corporate mentality about how that needs you to missed run. the whole consolidation move in yeah. the 90s where schools were thrown together and and there's good things to having big schools because you get more classes you got more opportunities but then there's a huge chunk of students that get left behind and I think that's one of the fallouts from these super districts. You know, when I was a kid, I went to a, a <laughs> you won't believe this, but a school, it was called 7B. That was our classification. So 5A, 4A, 3, 2, single A, 7B. <laughs> so there was 25, we were a bigger class, 25 people in my entire grade. Up until, and I was a, you know, big shot, because you had to be. It's just 25 kids. You know these people since kindergarten. There's something to that. There wasn't many kids just kind of completely left out. You're kind of like a family. And then my, my school consolidated my junior year, and I got through into Sheridan, which is like Lakeside. It's as big as Lakeside. So, and, and a lot of, there's a school called Leola, Grapevine. All these schools got through, you know, and then it's just like 
it's easier to kind of get lost in the shuffle and I don't know I mean I, once again I'm not against bigger schools because of opportunities but that could be an effect of some of the stuff we're seeing I actually had an opposite experience than what you had because when I when I was in uh, you know ninth and tenth grade I was actually going to school in Oklahoma I, I we lived in Tulsa and uh, the school I was in had like three floors and an elevator and, and like 3,000 kids per grade. And I had, I mean, there was just this wave of people that would just move between classes. And you got you caught up in that. And uh, my grandparents became ill. They lived here and we came to uh, take care of them. And my mom got a job. She was a teacher. She got a job at Mountain Pine. And so that's where I went. That's where I graduated high school, junior and senior year. And I came in the first day, and I was looking around, and we were going to have this assembly. We're all sitting in the gym, and the principal's going to come and talk to us. And I'm sitting there, and it's like half one side's kind of full. And I was like, this buddy next to me, I'm like, dude, is there like, are buses late? Like, what's the deal? <laughs> and he goes like, no, bro, this is it. And I'm like, Whoa. I realized that it was going to be a different experience than what I'd had before. There were 42 of us in my graduating class. And that there's, there's still, between those of us that formed major bonds, I think there's still that camaraderie that exists today that I would never have really had, I think, in that larger school, and nothing against larger schools. I think I think that Lakeside is actually a pretty decent sized school that we have. You know, you can kind of, everybody can kind of find their niche, if you will. You know, and, and and find that group of kids that they really can connect with. Not everybody's going to get along. I get that, but at the same time, I think that the opportunities are there. But at the same time, I really did enjoy the the smaller school setting. Ultimately, I think that I I think that I functioned better there in the long run. You know, and I met my wife, future wife. She wasn't my wife in high school, so that was awesome. Yeah, um, and also with big schools, I think this is why it's so important to join a club, to play, to do these secondary sports that are called secondary because they catch. I know when we started soccer at Sheridan, we got a bunch of kids that wouldn't have done anything else, but they played soccer, mm -hmm. and then that because you know when you only have two or three sports, and you know you know those junior high kids that they play for a while and then they quit. If they were at a small school, they'd have played the whole time and you know started on the you know so. We just want to make sure that we don't lose those students and, you know, it's up to you leaders to locate those people that are isolated or feel alone or don't have any, you know, that's 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 a aren't, good thing to do. Are, aren't there some schools in this state that take like two days to graduate? Or aren't there schools that big in Arkansas? Huh? Fayetteville? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, some of those other ones are. Bryant is that big? Okay, yeah. See, the, to me, that's like, I don't, how do you, how, how do you, how do you find yourself there? You know, I mean, I, if you know what I mean, does it? Okay. Well, all right. So go, go small schools. Go, go small schools. Go. All right. Who else? Yeah. Oh. What is it? I'm sorry. What was the? <laughs> do we think that the Florida shooter deserves the death penalty? Okay. I've got an opinion. Okay. Uh, boo, boo, boo. Okay, so, first of all, there are human beings that do such horrific things and they're at a certain age and a certain, you know, that they, there's no rehabilitation, life in prison, whatever. The problem with the death penalty is always this. Now, I'm just talking about death penalty in general. Four to five percent of the time that they kill someone, the government does, it's the wrong person. <laughs> now, that's an innocent person we're killing, 4 to 5%. That's one of the problems with being for it, just carte blanche. We should. However, philosophically, I'm for it, um, as opposed to putting someone who in prison for, you know, two, three life sentences or whatever. I, th I think that... And paying... Is there any chance in the world that there's a... Is there any way to rehabilitate this moment? And, and I know that this is a heinous crime, and the immediate knee-jerk reaction is to take that boy out and string him up. And like, right? I know there are other people that would like to see that happen. And part of me wants that too. Part of me says, no, you, you don't deserve to be on the planet because you're that much of a threat. And if it continues to be, if it's proven that he would be a continuous threat, then what do you, I mean, is it from a humanitarian standpoint, does this retribution against him by the state if that's the way that goes does that solve anything i mean it's not a it's not going to be a deterrent to anybody else that's been proven um, people are going to do what they do so we can't we have to take that out of the equation so is it plausible possible that 
through extensive counseling and and you know is would this person eventually as a life in prison person perhaps but I, this is where it gets tricky he's 19 i know he's God. a kid I, I i can't imagine spending an entire life but again i can't imagine somebody pulling a trigger like he did either right so uh, that's that's so that's rough man i don't know that's it's it's all case by case, and it's yeah. it's hard for us. I mean, if you, we have to completely take emotions out, because if you were one of those parents, if this was my daughter, could you know, yeah. I right. would feel oh, much yeah, differently. Exactly. If it was my kid, I'd be like, no. And I've I've thought about that through too, especially after I had children. Right. I, 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 there's part of me that would go, you know, if you did, if you ever did anything to my kid, like I couldn't stand it. There. Remember the. Um, who was this doctor guy? This Larry Nasser dude, right? The guy that was the. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and he and he and he molested all the girls that were the yeah. All right, so in court, did you see this where the guy was standing there and like they gave all the victims a chance to speak out against him? He has to sit there and listen. And then there was one girl who was talking, and her dad and, and mom were there. And apparently, the dad flipped because the 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 guy was listening. I mean, the the Larry Nasser guy was listening to the daughter give the the thing, and he was shaking his head like no, blah, blah, blah. and the dad freaked and like went for him. He just lunged for him, right? I. I he asked the judge, could you give me five minutes alone with Please, him? just let me ha have just a moment alone with that guy. How about Please. one minute? <laughs> no, nope. okay, I'll take him now then. Like, I, I empathize with that moment, right? Because I don't know, I, I would absolutely be out of my mind if something happened to my kids, especially like that, you know? So, I, I, but again, that's, that's, that's retribution-mindedness, and I don't know that it ultimately helps. I don't know. We, I'm, we, not, I'm, not, I'm not against the death penalty. But at the same time, is there any kind of hope in salvaging this for anybody, I don't know. We just, it's just something that's We have that's the highest, so complex. Uh, what's it called? It starts with an R. Recidivism. Right, which means you, you get charged with a crime, you go to jail, you get let out, you do another crime. Yeah. Our jail systems could be the worst at rehabilitating, plus we incarcerate more people than any country on the planet. Something needs to change there, but I don't... I know he definitely deserves punishment. What is that exactly? I'm, I don't know, because part of me says, yeah, just get him out of the way because if we, you know, then he can't be a threat to anybody and he's not going to milk a system. For, it's going to cost a lot of money to keep him in prison for the rest of his life, right? Let's say he lives to be 65 or 70. That's a lot of taxpayer dollars that's funding somebody to keep him alive because he's going to be, we spend more money in this country on prisoners than we do on students and educational. You know, we, that, so that seems awkward, right? So is it better just to get rid of the person? Oh. It depends on... What moment you ask me how I feel about that one. It's that complex. Well, here's, here's kind of the thing. Like in Singapore, they don't have a drug problem. But there's a reason. <laughs> They'll cut your head off if you get caught with what, weed. What rights are you willing to give up in a so, supposedly free society to maintain that kind of strict control over people? Like if that's the way it's going to be, if you, if you want to just hammer down on everybody who might make some sort of small mistake, we can do that. You, know, you ever seen somebody get caned? Wow. They tie this person up with this area exposed in this thing. And this guy stands like in a samurai stance with a huge cane and hits like Barry Bonds. Mm -hmm. After two of them, the guy sometimes passes out. So you get like three canes or four. And the leader said, look, we're willing to punish our citizens that harshly because we don't want the drug problem that you guys have. We'd rather do this. Now, I don't want to live there. I'd rather live here. <laughs> so there is a balance. Yeah. Yes. Uh, all right. Let's, is, there, is this going to be more lighthearted, perhaps? Or are you still going to be? Okay. All right. Okay, good. You going to isms? you have a favorite ism? <laughs> yeah. I have something called Pumphreyism, but I haven't quite finished it. But I'll let you know. <laughs> Genius. Um. I, I, well, see, I don't know. That's hard to like, sort of nail down. The uh, the idea that there's more to any story, right? And I don't know what that would, what we would call that. Universalism, maybe. Like the idea that there's something. Uh, whoever said? Did you say progressivism? Like the idea about being progressively minded, being open minded enough to 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 look at all things together and then try to make some decisions rather than be myopic. Like I really, I'm against the idea of just standing in one place, staring almost through like a, a uh, you know, just one singular lens. Uh, I don't think that that helps you become a more well-rounded person, which is my ultimate goal. Alt altruism, I guess, is the word that we're looking for. The idea that I can sort of 
transcend beyond my own personal desires and needs and wants and, and greed and those things to try to help more people. Like that it's about us rather than just singular to me. Right? That's what I would hope to aspire to, right? There's a programmer for Facebook, maybe, that programs some of the algorithms that makes you see things that you want to buy, click on things. It's, it's that kind of thing. The guy eventually got fed up with it, pushed it all aside, and now he's he is teaching about altruism and, you know, giving, you know, a certain percentage of your wealth to the needy and, and things like that. So, well, if, you know, but there's some there's an interesting truth in that. If you look at, I mean, the, the, regardless of which religion that we may go down or which philosophy we go down, they all sort of end up there, right? It, it, they get there through different paths, but the idea is that you need to get over yourself to find some better way forward for for humanity. Like, if, if I were to look at Hinduism, for example, they have something called Atman, which is the, the idea of discovering the true fire the sort of godlike presence inside yourself, which is supposed to give you centeredness and, and well-being. In Buddhism, there's something called Anatman, which is the opposite of it. It's the not-self. It's the fact that you've discovered who you are, and now you've got to get over that to find a way to help more people. All right? So you, you're, which is tricky, right? But they all do that. All of them seek to find something that transcends you into a higher philosophical realm so that you can be more... Uh, Inspirational. Most of the major philosophies, religions, all have a thread of selflessness or self-restraint, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's always kind of something to think about. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Good okay. Question. Yes. It's the same reason we're not hearing about the war in Yemen. It's. It's not. It's, yeah, it's not the reason Puerto Rico is not in the news much. Even though they still have massive problems there, right? The infrastructure is still down. We still have a lot of people yeah, that don't electricity. have electricity. They had, they, for the part of the island that had electricity, apparently there was some major meltdown the other day and they lost it. Uh, you know, I, those are American citizens. And they deserve better than to have somebody, you know, do layups with paper towels and think that this problem is solved and we come home feeling good about ourselves. Take um, me to your leader. Mm -hmm. You're our leader. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, we should know more about that, and we should think more about that, and we should be... The only way that stuff like you're talking about is kept going is through activism. It's through people caring enough to keep sharing stories, to keep going out there and, and saying stuff and getting people going on it because America has the shortest attention span on the planet. Yeah, I was going to We're all about something and then we just okay, well that's uh, you know, we're we're ADD what's, America. What's the next shiny object that we can focus our attention on? And I mean, I see it every day. And know? Trump is the ultimate just shining all the time. He does something outrageous, something new. And then something new. And then we forget because a day later he does something else and and that might be the genius. He just keeps you and he's in the news constantly. This is how he won the election. He was in the news. Well, he sucked up all the airtime. I, I mean, think, that's one of the reasons. I think a lot of people, too, are just uh, impatient. You know, and they think, well, it, somebody did something, somebody said something, so therefore it's fixed and on to the next. You know, they're impatient for it to be right, and it's, it takes a long time to do things like that. It takes a long time to rebuild infrastructure. And so that's, but that's boring. And so people, because we're so used to being entertained 24 freaking 7, if it's not entertaining to us, it doesn't have some sort of dramatic element that keeps our attention, other dramatic things happen and we, we go off to those tangents seemingly, and then we don't come back to the ones that still, like it still matters, it's still going on, it's still a problem, but we've compounded ourselves because we have this barrage. Here, you know what, here's the thing, and going back to the sort of the new stuff that we were talking about a while ago, uh, when... And I, I don't mean to sound like the old guy saying, back in my day, it was like, you know, but I'm going to. Okay? Too late. When we were your age, there was, you know, you had certain avenues to be able to get news sourcing. And it was like this steady, almost sometimes a trickle, but you still got information, right? And so to me, it's like, I, I envision it like taking a drink out of a water fountain. You got this stream that you can sort of dip into and you get information. Today with internet and all these other things that we have, and, and all the different media sources that you could attach yourself to in the 24-7 news cycle, it's like trying to take that same drink out of an open fire hydrant. It's just, it's just rushing at you. And sometimes it's just impossible to get much out of it when you try to take a sip, right? I don't know. But that's why. What else? Uh, somebody said, uh, there was one question that said, what event would you like to see a movie made out of? Oh, yeah. That had, yeah. Mm. 
Do you have any events? I tell you, they could have made a good Alexander the Great movie, but I didn't like it that much. I think that could be well done. Alexander the Great, that's a... It's unbelievable, that whole story. Yeah, wasn't that, isn't there a Brad Pitt movie that's Alexander the Greatness or something? Colin Farrell? No, I want to say it's Brad Pitt, right? No, I don't know. He did Troy. Somebody, oh yeah, Troy, but I thought he did, I thought there was an Alexander one too. I know. Uh, I, you know, since we're going to Italy, it's on my mind, but a, story, a movie about Hannibal, like, that guy was cool. So I think that would be an interesting movie. And they may have that in I'm other sure countries, they do. but I don't know. 50s, 60s. Of course, but again, I don't know how many Americans know who Hannibal was. And because when I say Hannibal, most kids go, you mean Lecter? No, not, no. <laughs> like, no. Clarice. Hann- <laughs> it, no. <laughs> Hannibal Barca, the great African <laughs> general who took on the Romans. I think there'll be a 9-11 movie come out. Are they there? had United 93. Well, they've got the twin. Isn't, no, no, there's a... I there was a Nicholas Cage. There was a bunch of little movies that yeah. are early that was trying to do so. But right. I think they'll probably have some sort of blockbuster to relive that, which I'm not saying that'll be good or fun. Um, mm, right. I see that happening. Mm, 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 mm. We need another World War II movie. No, no, I'm tired of World War II. God. Yeah, let's get past that. So... Yeah, there are yeah. yeah something besides all quiet on the Western Front. A nice a new take on the World War One story, which may which could be more inclusive because again it was a World War. Lots of people from other places were in that conflict, right? Not just Europeans. So maybe that would be something we could. A do. good Teddy Roosevelt movie. Teddy Roosevelt fighting in the Spanish American War and then just being president. Mm-hmm. Teddy Roosevelt had earned uh, Panama. We just Canada yeah we just on. talked about this. I think you talked about this too. Like he earned himself a nice uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Oh yeah, he's he's the he's the father of peace. Bro- Old Teddy bro- Roosevelt brokering the peace between the Russians and the Japanese. That was a good thing. Yeah, he did. Nineteen oh, seven four yeah. something. Yeah. All right, Noah. Huh? favorite book. Oh, well, I don't read, so <laughs> it's gonna. When did you stop? Movie, stop? TV show, <laughs> come, come on, song, um, <laughs> book. Ugh. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Depends on. I mean, there's. It depends on the genre. You know, actually, one of my favorite books that I, uh, the original Frankenstein, is really different than you think it would be. I mean, it's just it's the the monster. I mean, people go, well, Frankenstein. They think about the monster. The, the Frankenstein was the doctor, right? And so people go, oh, well, I didn't know that because the movies don't show it that way. You know, all you see is like bolts and the like. But the monster could. He learned to talk. The monster's name was Adam. He had a name. Um. And then all of a sudden, you know, you watch. It's just different. So I would, I really like that. Um, Is anybody going to Italy with us? Yeah, who else going? Okay, I've got you a book, Angels and Demons. There's right. been a movie now, whatever. But I read that book for the first time on the way to Italy, and then I saw all this stuff that's in the book. That made that book come alive in a way that most books don't because I, I never read it. But it's the... Uh, what's the other big book he had? Da Vinci Code? Mm-hmm. So it's the prequel to that. And and I liked Angels and Demons quite a bit. Once again, there's a movie now. But um, that was that was a good book, especially if you're going to Italy. Because it talks about Vatican City, running through the Sistine Chapel, all that. You know, and you can, then you walk through it. Um, if you want an epic read, that, and I think we've talked about this before, you and I, um, no, Divine Comedy, which is a difficult read. But once you get through it... I, I, that was one of those books where I, I was uh, I read it as a almost a, almost as a requirement in college, and I read through. But then I I didn't have to read the whole thing. I just had to read the Inferno, the first book. But then I was so intrigued by that, and I went on and read it Pur- uh, Purgatorio, and then in, and then Paradiso. And by the time I got through with that, I had like this enlightened moment. And I'm I mean it seems weird, but it was almost like as I was reading it, I could see light. It, the the world got brighter. It's so well it's so well written. You know, for something that was written in the 1300s, you would think, well, it's not really applicable today. No, I had an emotional, like it, I had a, a moment, m- multiple moments, as a matter of fact, reading that book. So we're going to see his, read um, that. but it's, it's hard to read, though. I would just say that. We're going to see his tomb. We did, yeah. We Along always, with Fermi from the wall. What else? What, is, oh, Michelangelo. That's, that's the Santa Croce, right? Santa Croce. Yeah. yeah. A, and then the um, Galileo's in there, Machiavelli's in there. Uh, who, uh, who else is, like, there's tones of. Uh, Michelangelo. Raphael's in the Pantheon. Ra- Raphael's in the Pantheon, right? Yeah. So anyway, that's cool. Yeah. Well, they're and they're going to take us there. So, my, my favorite conspiracy theory. Do you have uh, so many good ones? Uh, 
I, I think my generation was really hung up on the JFK thing, you know, who, who was really in charge of that. Um, uh, I don't know that it needs it. I don't know. There's a lot of uh, conspiracy. Well, one that's more relevant relevant to you guys, like there's apparently this floating conspiracy thinking that George Bush was responsible for 9-11. I don't know why that's a conspiracy, but apparently it is. Well, that's been around since right after it happened. Yeah. Because I know a lot oh, of it's it, weird, though. The, the, the way the buildings fell, it looked like a controlled explosion. And so that just got people, blah, 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 you know. Mm. I mean, there's a, we didn't go to the moon. Some of that actually, some of the pictures were faked. You know, a lot of it was done in a studio. Some of them, that, there's, a, there's a picture of Yuri you're, Gagarin. You're saying that the, the conspiracy theories say that it was faked. You're not right. saying it was I'm faked. I'm not saying it's okay, faked. Okay, just clarifying. The problem with the big stuff, especially like the moon landing, is the amount of people that would have to lie and keep that under wraps for decade after decade. No one, yeah. that no, you know, no, none of the astronauts just went, ah, Lit just, we didn't Literally do thousands and thousands and thousands of people would have to be involved in the conspiracy. And I know people, I know if you tell a secret to five people, they can't keep their freaking mouths shut, right? So you think that thousands of people would be able to keep this under wraps? I just don't think that's a thing. But I mean, there are oh, conspiracies. Uh, like the JFK, there's probably... You know, there's too many people talk about that with their eyebrows up. It just scares me. You know something's going on. Um, I've had this interesting moment in class this year in particular where when I say things about, you know, sailing around the world or flying around the world, I get this chorus of kids who go, the world is flat. Like, when did that become a thing again? Last year. Flat Earth Theory. See, wow. there you go, right there. The Earth is flat. The Earth is flat. Your head is flat. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? <laughs> that's oh, yeah. you know what? That's a great point. Freaking cats! I think there. Okay, my conspiracy theory is that cats are secretly waiting to take over the world. They they want they're going to eat you in your sleep. That's going to be a thing. There's going to be this cat rebellion eventually, right? Just don't trust cats. I can't try to. I cat cat tried to. I can't try to kill and eat my brother. That's why I think that. Seriously, I have more respect. Okay, I used to hate cats. I hate cats. I used to, I mean, they're snakes, really. I mean, they're eyes and they, it's like the craziest animal. And they'll just jump on you. You look, you look at them and you don't know what they're thinking. All of they, a sudden they, I know what they're thinking. They're conspiring to kill you. That's what they're thinking. And it's, maybe. But you got to earn their love. If they had so opposable, something. If cats had opposable thumbs, it would have been done by now. If a cat could hold a knife. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I respect cats and the fact that they're, they're, like, they, they don't care about you. What? You know? I mean, it's not... How like you, dogs. When you think about dogs... Why would, you, no, why would you have a pet that is condescending to you? I don't know. It's like that. cats are like, yeah, there you are. I just kind of like... That's a low-level energy. You know? They kind of like, like to be petted a little bit, and they're like, all right, I don't need you. You ever, you ever stop and pet a cat, and then all of a sudden, he's like purring, and it's all nice, and then it goes... And it like bites your hand and like jumps away. I'm like, what the hell did I do? I didn't do anything to you. I was being nice. The and kittens... turned on me. The kittens that spit. That's... I remember the first time that where I reached down and they <laughs> the other, it's like, what are you? What the hell are you? Huh? Cats. No, I don't. I don't. Well, all right, let me. Let me Why clarify. do they growl when they're happy? Oh. <laughs> let me clarify my position. Happy? I don't hate cats. I don't want any in my house. I'll like your cat because I can be there temporarily and then I can move away from it. But I don't trust them at all. That's a fact. I do not trust cats. Dogs are just too stupid to be dangerous, ultimately, right? So they're lovable that way. They're like, oh, we're so glad to see you. You can leave a room and you come back and they're like, oh, we're glad to see you. I was like, I was just here. Like, I, it was Where like, have you been? <laughs> I thought you were never coming home. No, I, I just went to the bathroom. I'm right back. It's okay. Cats, on the other hand, Dogs, just, chill. Yeah. Cats, yeah. cats just wait and lurk and plot <laughs> and scheme. Seething evil. Is that what there's... But they're cute. I mean, I got cats are cute. I really think that kittens, especially. I think they're really cute. But even, you know, no, I can't. Right. If I said if it hadn't been for the fact that one of them tried to kill my brother, maybe I'd feel differently if that wasn't a thing. Is it scarier to think that we are not alone in the universe, or that we are alone in the universe? Which one of those is a more daunting idea? You and I. No, I'm just saying, that just from a concept sake. Like, I can't prove it. Either. Huh? Alone. To, well, you know, here's the thing. 
Hello. You think that it's scarier to think that there, there's other intelligent life in the universe? Why? They, if they land with their warships, it'll be scary. Well, okay. <laughs> All right, well, that aside. <laughs> yeah. Here's... Well, here's... Well, this, here's something that my son said to me when he was about 12 years old, and we were having this same conversation, and he said, you know what, if, if this is, considering the size and the scope of the universe, and it's expanding into something, right, isn't that a gigantic waste of space? And I thought, well, uh, yeah, I mean, that was brilliant, right? And in a weird way, if there's not, I want to believe that there's something else out there. That's, to me, that's more comforting. And if there's not, that lessens my opinion of God, because what are you doing with all that space? It's unnecessary. Stretching out. For sure, we didn't even know about it until the 1600s. I mean, more specifically, right? I don't know. Okay, so we know we have seen 3,000 planets or so, most of which are gas. They say there are about 20 billion Earth-like planets in our, just our galaxy. Our galaxy is the only thing we could ever hope to, to explore, unless there's some sort of light wormhole thing, you know. But our galaxy is kind of all there is that we could possibly actually go out into, ever. Oh, yeah. Well, here's, here's a good thing. They're probably bacteria. Somebody said, well, 20 billion Earth-like planets, there's got to be one of them with life. And then, but then a, a biologist would say, well, it's about one in a 20 billion chance that you can go from a single-celled organism to us. So there's all this, you know... Here's what, uh, what's his name, Tyson? Neil deGrasse Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson. said. Yep. He said, look, okay, there is, who, who, we share who 90. Who was a Haas in college, by the way? Did I tell you I saw that picture? Yeah, wrestler. Yeah. Wow, that, go look up young Neil deGrasse Tyson. Dude's a beast. Yeah. He said, um, we share 99% of our DNA with chimpanzees. So there's just a 1% well, DNA difference. We also share most of our DNA with bananas, too, so I'm not sure that's making a good point. Right, but our closest one, oh, okay. let's say 88 with bananas, 99 with... But that 1% makes a difference, right? Between chimpanzees, the smartest one and the smartest human. Okay. If there are aliens, mm -hmm. let's just assume that they're 1% above us. They would look at us like we look at chimps. chimps. Okay. So they would be like... Oh, look, they're just doing uh, quantum mechanics. That's cute. My toddler can do that. Let's skip that planet. <laughs> Let's go on out. You know, yeah. they really could look at us Why as would they want animals. to control us? We're not really that good. Yeah. We're destroying this planet. Why do they want it? Yeah. We're probably not filled with, you know, especially now with our modern American diet, we're probably not very healthy to eat either, so that's not going to be a thing. So they're not, why would they even bother coming here? That's uh, another fear is yeah. space junk might encapsulate yeah. us into this anyway. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it, well, yeah, we I can't mean, even. They have like, to time rockets now well, to go through the space jump. Isn't there a thing? Isn't there a, 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 some sort of hypothesis that says that we can't actually overpopulate the planet that because the resources will run out, then we'll just have a depopulation that then balances it back out? I They're mean, saying that, now that we're going to balance out somewhere around 13, 12 to thirteen billion, maybe. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, if there's reincarnation, what would you want to come? If you, you if, and not a not a human, just something else, or anything I want. What would you if you can if you could be if you could be reincarnated if that was a if human could, human? Well, no, I mean if you could be anything. Oh, if you could come as anything. Um, How about that shark that lives five hundred years? That wouldn't be bad. I nah. guess. Um, I need something more. I would be an a golden eagle out on the plains of Mongolia. No, I want something with a pretty good lifespan. I want to be a predator. Golden eagle. Alligator. A cat. Alligator. Cat. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hmm. Um, tiger. I think cat. cats are the pa cat. pound for pound strongest animal. Ants. Oh, ants, yeah. Did you know if you added up all the weight of the ants, it, it's like way more than humans? If you add up all the way to the humans and add up all the way to the ants, the ants is like way more. How do you? How would you? How would you guess? I that? did it last year. It took forever. Yeah. Could you? Uh, could you be happy as like a jellyfish or something that just you know floats around? An amoeba. Oh, ooh, you know what? No, I want something that has bioluminescence. I want like my I want my butt to glow at will. That would be cool. Yeah. Cool. Firefly. Bi I don't even know which muscle to flex. How, did you, how do you do that? <laughs> Wait a second, I'm flying. <laughs> what is that? How do I do that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 
Yeah, okay, so this came up in, in class today. When, when Puerto Rico votes, does it go into part of the electoral college scenario? I don't, I don't know how that, do you know how that works? Because Guam and American Samoa, and I mean, they get to vote. So, but, it's, but they don't have electoral votes, so how does that work? I don't know. I've never been asked that. See, we will find what out. What is it? Though. Huh? So it's just part of the overall tally then? Does it go into the, well, how, hmm. Hmm. I knew they were non-voting as far as like why do they Congress. get to why do they even bother voting then? Because there's no electorals involved, right? Okay. Okay, so the beauty of political science majors. Woo! Hey, y'all give it up for them letting us have this here at their at Collective Coffee as well. We appreciate y'all letting us come in and ramble. Yeah, thank you, Kevin and Agnes. Yes. All right. Thank y'all.